Alrighty, welcome everybody to the Grow Coach Garden Show. Ken Salville here today, just uh, doing the gardening thing. I hope to earn your subscription today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a few different things. In the, I know it's still winter time, but hey, gardening goes on all the time, of course, because we're all uh, avid gardeners. I, at least I hope you are. Um, I always say the winter time is the time that we do the the research. This is when we get the books out and we do some some learning, some reading, that sort of thing. Get get sort of a I don't know, fill in the gaps. Let's say. We want to have as close to 100% success as we can. You know, in the gardening business, that's kind of tough to, to hit that uh, because we are dealing with perishable living organisms. So uh, we just do the best we can. So learn as much as you can. And that's what we hope to do here on Grower Coach Garden Show is just to talk uh, more about all kinds of things from, from disease issues, pests, insects, um, even weeds or the plants themselves, growing conditions, soils, it just just everything that we can, as much information as we can, we want to get it to you so that you can have success. So again, today, uh, the topics that I wanted to talk about was particularly uh, the disease triangle. Not to be confused with the devil's triangle, but the disease triangle is is this uh, three-sided uh, thing. You can, you can actually look it up. It's a known thing. Look it up on, online if you like. And it'll show you that, it, that in order to have diseases in plants, you, you have to have three, three aspects of that. So we have to have the disease itself, we have to have the plant that gets infected, and then we have to have the right conditions. So those are some things you just can't do anything about. You can't do anything about having the disease there because most, let's say, fungus diseases or virus diseases, they're often around us at all times. We just don't know it because they're, they're microscopic and they, they float in. Uh, but, you know, on the disease triangle, if you have the disease, which we do in most cases, we have the plant, which, hey, we're plant people. We have all kinds of plants. And then it's the conditions, which is the, the, the one thing that we sometimes can, can have some, uh, you know, effect on. Uh, in our houses, we can we can set our temperatures maybe a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler at certain times. That can make a big difference. Having air circulation, like sometimes if you have little seedling plants, you want to get just a little tiny fan that you can sit there and just kind of blow air over them all the time, keep them moving around. We want to kind of replicate nature a little bit because nature always has these settings that are just ideal uh, for plant growth. That's where the plants evolved in. I actually find that sometimes we bring plants indoors, let's say seedlings or other plants we bring in, and the conditions inside the house are quite far away from what we would see in nature. So in nature, we wouldn't really see that like absolutely perfectly still air, like, you know, like just no air movement whatsoever. Like it doesn't happen very often. It happens from time to time, but you know, it might happen for a day or two or a week or something, but then sooner or later the winds come in and there's storms and all kinds of things. And so we know that air circulation is one of the key parts of keeping plants healthy and happy. Um, the other thing is, is that with, with light uh, indoors, you know, we get kind of poor light conditions, like unless, you know, even if we have grow lights, unless we have the maybe like high pressure sodium lights, which are really intense, more like real sunlight actually, then the plants grow sort of more normal and they will grow thicker leaves. So thicker leaves means that the leaf is thick and, and like leather. So often diseases that want to grow like powdery mildew wants to grow on the outside of a leaf. Well, it has a harder time getting through the surface of the leaf just due to the conditions and the leaf being so thick. So those are factors that sometimes we can control a little bit, meaning that we can add artificial light to indoor plants. And in, you know, outside, we just try to plant plants in the best location based on you know, what they're used to, what their conditions are. So uh, yeah, these are all things that, um, that, uh, that you can do and some things you can't really control, but temperature is one of the key most important things. Um, you know, even for tropical plants, like if you've ever traveled to the tropics, uh, you know, in the wintertime or whenever you get there, you'll find that there's still fluctuations in temperature, uh, even in the tropics. So daytime temperatures might hit, say, maybe 40 degrees or 30 degrees Celsius in the day. And then at nighttime, we're seeing temperatures that are down uh, as low as maybe 15 degrees 
Celsius at night and sometimes even lower. I can recall many times when I was down in Mexico or even in Florida and the nights got down to that 12 degrees Celsius and even a few times even down to 10 degrees Celsius through the winter months. And um, you'd find that, that is, those temperatures are normal. In more northern or temperate climates, you'll see a wider uh, fluctuation. You might actually find even hotter temperatures up to 40 or 45 degrees, like here in the sunny Okanagan. We're kind of a desert situation here. So we can get extreme heat and then at night drop right down to like eight degrees Celsius at night. So that's sort of almost more normal to have those wild fluctuating temperatures from day till night. You put them in your house and now you've got this, you know, 22 degrees all day and, and maybe 18 or 19 degrees at night. It's not much fluctuation. Um, I prefer to have a, a decent night temperature that's down a bit lower. And so with this disease triangle, the one thing that you can control is temperature, air circulation, the amount of light that plants get, and your nutrients. So if you're feeding with excessive amounts of nitrogen, the plants tend to grow quite soft. So if they're soft, they're going to be lush and you're going to find insects will be able to come in and, and eat their way through those leaves quite easily. Aphids are, you know, they can put their little proboscis into the leaf quite effortlessly. So those soft growth from excessive nutrients or excessive nitrogen particularly can be a factor that can stimulate uh, insects and diseases. So powdery mildew again, you know, when the leaves are soft and lush, the mildew actually sits on the surface of the leaf and it digests a, a hole through the, the cells and grows down into the leaf where it takes out the sugars and the, the nutrients out of the leaf. So the mildew is growing on the surface, but it's mining those cells for carbohydrates. So that's an interesting thing. So what can we do to prevent that? Well, we can definitely make the leaf thicker and stronger. So we know if we feed with high nitrogen, that it's gonna make it softer and easier for diseases like mildew to get in. But if we, if we counteract it with, with potassium and actually feed higher levels of potassium, it counteracts the nitrogen effect and potassium tends to make the cells sort of mature and become more, more let's say more rigid almost. So your leaves, instead of being soft and lush, they're more leathery and a little harder to, to, to get into. So there you go. Just a nutrient adjustment can be helpful. But just remember indoors, you know, the seasonal changes in the wintertime in, in Canada and the Northern areas that you, we don't get much light. So we don't want to be overfeeding. We just need a very tiny amount of nutrients through the wintertime. That's pretty much all we need. And that's, that's just the way to go. Alrighty, so uh, we're just going to move on to uh, our, our uh, email vault here really quick. We have a couple emails that have come in this week and we have uh, Sandy from West Kelowna who has sent in a question about her trees. She says that uh, trees have been damaged by heavy snowfall and we did get this really heavy wet snow uh, in the fall and, and it's really caused a lot of breakage. So really all you can do is those branches that are completely broken off is you really literally just cut them off and remove them. The wound on the tree is best not to do much with that at all. Um, you know, even on any extreme, the tree itself needs to sort of just take care of itself. And sometimes if we try painting it or something, it might cause a more problem than good. So just remember that about, uh, about uh, you know, painting wounds and stuff on trees generally not done very often. I know there's a lot of pruning paints available, but it doesn't really help the tree. And in many cases, it's proven to be actually detrimental to the tree. So don't really want to go in that direction if we can help it. The only thing that I've done sometimes if I had a really bad break and the tree is super valuable and I just don't want to lose it, I'll sometimes use a little bit of lime sulfur on a little paintbrush and just paint it in those little areas. And it's more or less, I'm just trying to give it a little chance or slow down that any disease organisms from getting in there. And so that is sometimes partially beneficial, but still no guarantees. The tree itself can be weakened and then you can have the other branches break off as well. 
because of the damage. Uh, occasionally, if you get a bad split, you can actually tie the tree up a bit and put a bolt through. Usually you're wise, especially with bigger trees, is to involve a, a very experienced arborist, arborist company, have them come in and potentially they might be able to put bolts through or even uh, through guy wires to hold the thing up or some sort of uh, cabling system. So that's pretty much all you can do. With other types of plants that are soft and flexible like junipers or cedars, that sort of thing, or cypresses, that then those plants, again, you cut off and, and remove any branches that are damaged, but you can often uh, start to sort of support the branches a bit through the winter months by using sort of a black twine material and sort of tying them up and holding them into place. So you hold them in place through the winter when the, the snow is bad and whatnot, and after the damage, you try to tie them up where you want them. And then uh, what happens is the plant will put on about 90% of its annual growth through May, June, and early July. So if we let it go through that growth period until about middle of July, then we can start to, to let loose those, those strings. Like we don't want to hold it too rigidly. It's actually the movement of plants that help plants grow extra material that holds these, these pieces together and actually strengthens it. So whenever you're tying things up is you don't want to tie them so tight that they can't move. They always have to have a certain amount of free movement. So if you do that, tie them in the winter, hopefully get through the winter, hopefully the next year after the growth phase that the plant has grown and strengthened that up a little bit, you can start to loosen off those strings a bit and let the plant sort of hold its own weight through the rest of summer. And then by the fall, you might be able to remove them, or you might want to leave the, the strings on for one more winter just to get through the second winter because you'll probably get heavy snow again. And then uh, the following year after that growth phase, you got to be in good shape. Hope, you know, if all goes well. So anyway, you never know what you're going to get there, but you do know that that heavy snow causes damage and that's just the way it goes. So, so thanks for that question, uh, Sandy. I hope I was able to uh, help there. Uh, Laura from Penticton has asked, uh, uh, she's uh, brought her begonia in from her deck and it's just barely alive now in the last couple of months. And she's wondering about some tips of keeping that alive. And uh, the thing is, is when you grow plants outside and then bring them inside, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're going through this potential really severe change in environment. I was talking about how, you know, that, that, you know, outside conditions are like this and inside conditions are not like that at all. They're sort of even temperature, still air. There's all these like unusual to the plant. It's unusual. It's not really ideal conditions. So, when you bring in this plant, the only thing I would say is that often those begonias are kind of tender, not super uh, vigorous. Some varieties you can cut them back and they'll grow back. Other ones you have to start drying them out and kind of making them go a bit dormant and then you can bring them back as the days get longer, closer to spring. But it's always a challenge. Uh, what I've tried to do is if I really love a specific plant like a begonia that's a little tender, it's a little bit delicate, that uh, if I have it outside in the summertime, I don't leave it till the very end of, of fall or whatever. I don't even leave it till it gets too cold. Uh, I wanna bring it into the house when the daytime temperatures are about the same as they are inside your house. So that would be, you know, if, it's, if you run a temperature that's about say two, 22 degrees Celsius inside your house, that's about, that's, you know, that's about the time when you start seeing those daytime temperatures hitting about that, time to bring it in and uh and it, like i say if you leave it too long sometimes it's just too much of a shock for it to come in so in other words when it's happy and healthy and it's dry that's the other factor if your plant is soaking wet and really soggy you know there's the odds of having it survive are going to be really tough so bring them in when the soil is a bit dry the plant itself is dry so not on a rainy day but a nice sunny a warm day and then bring it inside and then put it in a sunny location and just give it just the right amount of water to keep it going and slowly increase the water and, until you hit that sweet spot. So anyway, there's always lots of good tips about that, but um, begonias are one of my favorite plants. They're just the coolest. The whole family is super cool. I love them all. And um, I just wish I had better news for the fall, <laughs> bringing them in from outside because they struggle, there's no doubt about it. 
All right, so uh, that's it for the emails today. Uh, we're going to go back uh, out into the field now. Uh, last week we were out at Don Burnett's greenhouse and we were looking at sort of some of the plants and his fabulous tomatoes and, and it's looking, looking pretty cool out there. Uh, today we're going to do the second part of this particular uh, session, which is really on environmental controls and, and what he's done to get his greenhouse in that uh, sweet spot, adjusting his temperatures just so and uh, he's got the controls to do it. And that's really what, what, what I think uh, a lot of people are missing in their greenhouses is having all those controls to, to make it just hum along perfectly. And so uh, watch the video and I'm sure you'll be impressed. And so enjoy. So yeah, we're just uh, here talking with Don Burnett today. Um, and we're talking about the different ways, more efficient ways of, of heating greenhouses. And, and Don, you've, you, were, you were saying that the, uh, the cost of heating a small mm -hmm. greenhouse like this isn't too bad if you've too got bad. natural gas. It really isn't too bad. Uh, certainly if you're going to heat it with electric, uh, that's going to be quite costly. That's going to be your mess. And I do have a backup electric heater right here. My main heater is the gas Modine hot shot heater and um, but this guy here is a backup and I've put a relay system in here and a plug a 220 plug in case something malfunctions in the uh, in the gas heater uh, I'll get an alarm in the house and uh, I'll come out find out why the temperature dropped and uh, then I'll see oh the gas heater the electric electricity's on but the gas heater is not working. So there might be a fuse or something gone in there. So I can quickly plug in the electric heat for backup and switch it. I've got a switch here that says electric heater, gas heater. And um, that just automatically switches yeah, it over we'll, to the We'll show you that yeah, here yeah. in a minute. Yeah, yeah so... Um, but you were saying about uh, okay. having a boiler if you're Well, yeah, hot. yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if you can, I mean, the, the, the installation of in the, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure for gas-fired hot water is much more money than just throwing in a heater like this. Yeah. This heater cost me about 750 bucks, which is pretty yeah. reasonable, yeah. right? Um, whereas a, a, as a uh, boiler that's, you know, designed for a small greenhouse, probably in that $2,000, $2,500 range. Yeah. And then you've got all your piping and, and whatever that you have to get installed, so that's even more money. But in the long run, it's a lot less money to heat, and it's more efficient heat. My dad and grandfather uh, heated with sawdust and wood from 1932 to 1957. Right. With sawdust and wood. When I was born in 1950, our greenhouses were still being heated with sawdust and wood. And uh, we have an interesting thing here that I've, I've sort of took from our old greenhouse if you want to have a look at that it's a thing called an electric janitor and it's made by Honeywell and it's automatic or you can turn it on to uh, to uh, on or and what this does is it manages the the air intake of the furnace the draft it's called draft, a draft yeah it manages so that would be a wood fired wood or sawdust sawdust, sawdust, burn. sawdust burners yeah. and um, so in 1957 Inland natural gas was formed and gas came into the Okanagan. So dad bought a boiler, a little 10 horse cyclotherm boiler. He went up, he bought pipe, two inch pipe from the Headley Mines and actually went up there with a flat deck truck. Yeah, I remember you telling yeah. me this story. <laughs> went up to the, to the oh. top of the hill there on the Headley Mines where you used to see those buildings way up in the hills. Yeah. He went up there on the, with his flat it's deck a goat truck. Trail. Well, yeah, he said it was pretty hair-raising. And up, went up there and went into these, this damp mine and took apart these two-inch pipes. And I remember Dad leaning these pipes up against the shed down at the bottom, by the bottom door there, you know? Yeah. And he had the pipes leaning up against there, and he was banging them with a sledgehammer, and all the rust and everything was coming out of them. Yeah. But they were heavy-walled pipes. He, he put about a mile and a half of pipe in the greenhouses, three greenhouses, heated three greenhouses with that 10 horse boiler. And uh, when we took the, the thing apart in 1997, so that's uh, 50, that's 40 years later, yeah. 
those pipes were in perfect shape because he put in a, a fluid into the water that preserved the pipes. Right. So those pipes were in just great shape huh. when we sold the, the business. But in here, yeah. I have a, what we call a Wadsworth controller. And the reason that I got the Wadsworth was because, Ken, you and I installed Wadsworth in our greenhouse operation. Yep. And it's very simple to use. You go to menu. Well, first of all, first of all, it tells you it's 22.5 degrees Celsius in the greenhouse right now. Right. You go to menu, and you go to program, relay number one. Now, the relay number one is for heat, and the set point is set at 22. Yeah. Then you have a differential, and it's set at 2. So, in other words, the heater will kick in at 22, uh, at 24.5, right. because it's 2 degrees above the 22. Uh, um, and then it heats up, and then as it cools down... Sorry, sorry, it doesn't kick in. It turns off at the twenty-two point, uh, the twenty-four point five. Right. So it uh, goes two degrees warmer than what uh, whatever your setting is. Uh, yeah, the set point is twenty-two. So if the set point is at twenty-two and the differential is two degrees, it'll drop down to to uh, twenty, yeah. kick in, heat it up till till uh, twenty-four. 24 and then it cuts out, and it goes back down to, to 20 again. So it's just... And you can set that wherever you want. I can do any... I can set the differential at 5. I can set it, you know. Yeah. So along with this, that's the heat uh, portion of it. If I go to another sensor... I oh know that's the sensor. If I go to another, another um, relay, there's four relays in here. Three of them are for cooling. Mm -hmm. One is for heat. So in the summer, when I want to cool the thing, I set the uh, set point again uh, for cooling at a certain uh, temperature and the differential there. Yeah. If it comes up to, say I set the thing uh, at, at um, the first relay at uh, 32. So the, the cooling system, which is just the first thing that happens is the louvers at the bottom open up and the fan kicks in, drawing outside air in. If it can't keep to that set point, it, the fan kicks into one a stronger yeah. thing. That's the second relay, the second cooling relay. The third cooling relay kicks in the water pump, which brings water from a buried cistern up through a cooling pad. Yeah. So it's like a swamp cooler. Swamp cooler. Yeah. So that's the yeah. three stages of cooling, right? And I can keep this when it's when it's uh, you know 40 degrees outside, you know, like really a hot day, 38 degrees. I can keep this thing under 40 degrees. Yeah. Even though it's a greenhouse, mind you, I do put some shade cloth on as well. Yeah. So that's the interesting thing. You can actually have your greenhouse through the summer. Most often, greenhouses are just too hot to use in the summer in the open oven. Yeah. But so the controller open. ultimately provides your your environmental controls all summer in the cooling yep. end and then yep. once you get into the fall you start adding that heating component mm -hmm. and then once it cools right down you're just basically using it for yeah I've, I've got a i've got a cooling system here yeah that, maybe uh, can, uh, yeah so i've got various that. switches in here this is this is the wadsworth controller i've got leave it on right uh, greenhouse lights i've got the greenhouse heater that's a switch to the heater so i leave it leave that on and then the uh, cooling system, uh, I leave it off in the winter. So that's turned off in the winter. This is my electric heat, gas heat switch. I can go from either one. And when you flick the switch, the plug-in, is that triggered? That activates the plug-in through the controller. And then you've got a big plug-in yeah. that runs to your electric heater. So yeah. when you pull that out, all it does is for the Wadsworth controller is it switches from the gas to the electric yeah. and it keeps managing the heat the same That's way. That's the same way, yeah. yeah nice. But uh, I'll tell you that um, that uh, electric heat is expensive. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Try not to yeah. heat your greenhouse electrically. Right. Here's, here's um, my uh, injector system for fertilizer. This is called, this is called a... Um, ozone 
injector system and it's a siphonix system it yeah. just goes off the tap here that's a dram product that's it's a dram product, dram yeah. product. and it and it has the tube that goes into my my uh, concentrate there's the, the blue concentrated fertilizer in there and it's 15 to 1 so when I fill this up to the top I put three cups of fertilizer in there yeah and it and uh, 15 it'll it'll It'll, it'll go 15 of these by the time it's empty, 15 of those. So it, it does last a long time. And so this hose here is constant. It has fertilizer in it. This one here has fertilizer. It's just slightly blue. You can't really see it on the camera, perhaps, but it's slightly blue. It's got a blue tinge to it, see? Yep. This one, this, this tap here is just plain water. And so I use that. Sometimes I'll throw the hose on that and give the plants a good leaching. Yeah. Just to get rid of any salt buildup and stuff. And uh, yeah. That's so great. then I've got a potting bench. A little potting bench with my with my potting mix on there. I got a filing cabinet for all the records and stuff. I have a, a, an album of all the plants that we have in the, in our garden uh, that we've put plant. Some of them are <laughs> are dead. Like this peach tree, we don't have anymore. Yeah, it's been exchanged. <laughs> but, you know, it's just kind of nice to have. Yeah. And uh, well, that's what we often tell people to do. So you actually yep. practice what we preach, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, this this bucket of, of soil, this little basket of soil in here, is uh, used soil. Because for some things, you don't need brand new soil from the the thing, yeah. like for. When you're doing rooted cuttings and you're starting seeds, yes. Yeah. But if you're just transplanting some plants, this used soil from our old baskets and tubs outside, and I have a big bin of it out there, yeah. I bring it in for that so I don't waste the brand new soil on things that I don't need to. You bet. I use mine, I, I mix it with a little bit of sand, and I have a real sandy topsoil I mix, and I yep. mix it with about half and half with that and use it for my outdoor plants like perennial plants. Right. When I'm potting perennials yep. is because it's an inexpensive, yep. good way to recycle. So I got a little bin under here full of soil. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got uh, over here I got my pots stashed. Yeah. Pretty cool. And of course a picture of my dear dad with our poinsettia yeah. crop back in the day. Ernie Burnett. He's just awesome. And look at that crop. Just amazing. By the time we were through, it was, it was getting over ten thousand. Oh yeah, I remember it was so like almost 15, almost fifteen with the little guys, yeah. Yeah, fifteen thousand plants. So I remember we had to calculate them, and yeah, we'd you'd have to know how many cuttings to bring in at the end of May or whatever yeah. it was in early June. And That's right. You had to calculate how many cuttings mm -hmm. and how what they were going to turn into. And this is me with our poinsettias in 1976. 26 year old thin guy. Yeah, <laughs> black hair too. And dark mm -hmm. hair, yeah. yeah. Dark beard. Yeah. So is this a mini max thermometer there on the wall? Yeah, this is a minimum maximum thermometer. It goes outside. It goes inside temperature and outside temperature. Yeah, mini max so, is definitely a requirement for anybody who has a greenhouse of any kind. You yeah. got to know what's going on at night. What's yeah. the minimum temperatures? What are the maximums? Mm -hmm. It just guides you on a daily basis as to how to set everything up. And of course, this is the old style one right here. Yeah. Right here. And it, it's it's outside too, so I but but I use the I use the electronic one more now. I hardly ever look at this one. But the other thing, sensor. the other <laughs> this is the most important thing in the greenhouse. You know, when you've got a bunch of of uh, plants in the greenhouse that are valuable to you, um, one of the worst things that could ever happen is the greenhouse freezing at night. And uh, so I want to know what the temperature is and I want an alarm if the temperature goes off. And I can't get my phone to turn on again to show you this whole system. No, oh, maybe it's this button here. I re anyway, I rarely turn my phone off, so I don't know. Let me see. Yeah, is that yeah, how you turn it on? The old sensor, sensor push. Yeah, anyway, this is the sensor. This will send through my Wi-Fi all the information, humidity and temperature out of the greenhouse, this little guy. And it's about 75 bucks for that. 
but I've had it now for almost three years. And I just added to my whole system this guy, so that no matter where I am, it goes through the internet, and I can, I can, uh, if I'm in Vancouver, I know exactly what's going on in my greenhouse. And so I want to get a few more of these. I want to have one for outside. I want to have one in our deep freezer. You know, you ever thought about that in a deep freeze? Yeah. If you've got a bunch of stuff in your deep freeze and you, fr and you don't go to the deep freeze as often as you might, and the thing fails, what happens to stuff in the deep freeze? Yeah. Not a good thing. So um, I'm going to put one of these in there. So you can have one of these... Uh it's like it's not really a controller, but this is how it connects through the internet. It's through the internet, and, but and, and you and you sensors. and you can do multiple sensors. You can go to each yeah. sensor, and it does humidity and temperature. Yep. And it, does it also do like minimum maximum? It tells you what your day and night. It tells you oh. on a, on oh, a oh, graph, yeah. right? A graph, and you can print it off, and you can send it to somebody. Oh, you can do all fabulous. sorts of stuff. That sounds like a good thing. I know I I, I I was eyeballing those uh, about a year and a half ago and then I mm. kind of I don't really have a greenhouse yet now we have the geodesic domes that we're yep. setting up and uh, we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be rigging up one of these here's, here's something uh, oh this it's is the old one yeah. I remember that yeah. I rigged this up this is for a misting system I have a this is really my propagation desk here, bench. It's under under the, your cables. Feeding cables, yeah. I got from Ken, actually. Cables yeah. over here. And we have our, um, this is the controller for that. So if I plug this in here, now I now have heat under this bench. And I have a, also, coming off of here, I have a system of misters that can come off of here and hang above my thing. Oh, so can, yeah. And basically how this works is it shuts, it turns the misters off and on. And it's it's got a it's got a, um, a mercury switch in there, so when the mist comes down like this, it weighs this thing down, like that, and shuts off the mist. And then when that dries out, it comes back up, turns, it turns on. the mist back on. We saw one of these in Olds, Alberta, actually in a greenhouse in Olds, Alberta. So I went and home and I built this. Right. And this is the same one we used in the in the greenhouse. Until we got that electronic one. Remember that little electronic thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Times change, but this thing worked that so worked well fine. for worked years fine. and years. Yeah. And you can set inside here. You see, there's a there's a weight on there, so you can set that weight back and forth to, for sensitivity. And you can see the you can see the uh, mercury switch in there too. Very simple, but it's a, it's, it's a uh, whether I'll ever use it again, I don't know. Alrighty, welcome back. Um, yeah, pretty cool Don's greenhouse there. It, it's pretty neat, all the, the interesting controls that he has. And thanks very much, Don, for, for letting us come out and check that out. Uh, I believe we're going to have another little bit next week too, so uh, maybe check back on that, at least a few more gardening bits. Um, all right, uh, just to continue on the show here. Um, uh, really important to uh, to think about, uh, you know, begonias and that sort of thing. Just because we were talking about that before before we went over to Dawn's there, but um, yeah, tuberous begonias are one of these pretty cool plants. Like I find are just fabulous. And and what I'll do is I'll 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 get some uh, some pictures either to add into this show or else we'll get you something for for next week. Um, but uh, tuberous begonias that you buy them as like this big lump of flesh that you, that you gets an actual tuber and you buy them in the garden centers and they're often the more exotic uh, large flowered uh, types of begonias uh, many of them are grown in baskets or planters outside the camellia flowered ones are particularly fabulous um, I really like the orange colored ones because they're just so vibrant. Uh, it's just one of my favorites. Uh, but out of all the begonias, they're great. The whites, yellows, orange, red, like they come in an assortment of colors. But these are the tuberous ones and they get a little bigger and they get a little bit, uh, some of them actually trailing. They have a, like a long stem on their flowers. Really, really nice. Uh, typical of, uh, of the begonia family is that you'll see the, 
the male flowers are more singles and the, the female flowers are these beautiful big double flowers. So just an interesting note there. Uh, but uh, begonias are, are just one of my all-time favorite plants. And, and I know for a while, uh, I've been in the business for, for a long time, for over 40 years. And through that time, I've had, I've had so many different experiences with begonias. It's just uh, really, I would say, it's really borderline, but I think it's my favorite plant. Um, uh, what I'll do is over the over the next few months here, so I'm sure we'll have other shows with begonias and I'll try to get a full assortment of plants in so that you can sort of see some of the different types and I'll dig into my archives of photos and get you some pretty cool pictures of some other types of uh, begonias. So great plant. Uh, just really quick, uh, what bugs you this week? Uh, what's bugging me is sow bugs. And if anybody knows the little sow bugs, I actually have one right here, but they just, they're also called pill bugs because they, they roll up into a little ball. I don't know if you can even see that on the screen there, but um, just a little ball and uh, they open up and they go around like, a, we used to call them uh, armadillo bugs when we were kids. But uh, the sow bugs are pretty common in our gardens. And you know, I would, I would say about 10 to 20 years ago, these things were just completely inert. All they would do is help us compost. And I don't know, I could be wrong, but it seems like they've changed. They used to just eat leaves and decomposing plant material in the garden. And um, that was great. You know, we thought, hey, sow bugs, that's cool. You know, you'd get a few here and there and they'd help you break down the compost. But it seems like in the last 10 years, they have really become quite a pest in the garden and they're starting to eat everything. They're eating my strawberries and raspberries. They're eating, they're climbing up plants and eating the berries off the, off the plants. They eat my bean plants. So I have, I have bush beans and then they haven't been eating my pole beans because I don't think they can climb that high. But the bush beans, they'll chew them off at the bottom and then the whole plant falls and then they eat everything, the leaves, the beans, everything. It's pretty amazing and, and their numbers are just like thousands of them, it seems like. So I'm not sure what, uh, what's going on with sow bugs, but they've certainly changed their feeding habits as far as I know. Um, that's just what I've noticed. I found uh, one time at a client's property, um, they had this huge wall. It was about a 30 foot high stucco wall and it was about 60 feet long. It was sort of in the back of a big garage. And the entire wall was covered like literally from the ground to the top was solid with sow bugs and they were migrating. I swear there must have been about 30 to 50,000. I don't even know, maybe more than that, maybe 100,000 of them. And uh, it was just, it was kind of shocking in a way. Um, not really sure what's going on with sow bugs, but anyway, real pain for sure. Uh, so what I've done, uh, I just take a jar like this, little jar here, and then I bury it out in the garden, and I just bury it right down to where the soil surface is e equal to the top rim. And then uh, you don't even have to put anything in there. The little sow bugs just fall in and they can't get out. And so this thing like literally fills up with sow bugs. And then of course you just empty it out, you know, every couple days or whatever. So this helps to reduce the population. You can just use any kind of a little cup or glass or pretty much anything that works pretty well. Um, anything will work. They're kind of, I guess they're not really super intelligent, but whatever, you just put a, put anything in the ground, they end up in there. I know sometimes uh, people, if you wanna collect, say, wireworms, they also will get in here. But what you do there is you just take a little piece of a potato, like a little cube of potato, and drop it in there. That would also attract, I'm sure, the sow bugs, but the wireworms would then go in there and you trap them in the exact same way. So it's kind of a cool trap. Uh, weevils too, little weevils that, that live in the garden, they often notch the leaves, can be a real pain as well. And so that, that trick also catches weevils. So whatever you catch, maybe you don't know what you have, but this way you'd find out for sure. So, so that's a good tip for today. And uh, again, I do really appreciate everybody tuning in uh, to the Grower Coach Garden Show. Um, we're going to do our best to bring you some new information each week and maybe a few cool videos. Uh, next week, we're going to talk a little bit about fig trees, growing figs like in cold climates and warm climates. And uh, we'll also probably have a little video or so as well. 
And yeah, we're going to just continue on with our program. And we, again, really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, remember to check in each week and remember to subscribe. It's one of the most important things that helps us keep going. And so don't forget about that. Also, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, on there, we'll also get you some cool information and lots of gardening tips because that's what it's all about. All right. Thanks again for tuning in. See you next time.